بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق نصر الحق بالحق والحادي إلى سراتك المستقيم على آله وصحبه حق قدره ومقدار العظيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم So the title of the book in Arabic is uh, it's, it's a translation of a, a book called Fadail Al-Awqat Fadail Al-Awqat And if we look at the, these two words in Arabic you get a feel of what the book is actually about and I, and I know the book is uh, is very new and uh, Maulana Afifuddin uh, brought some copies which I believe disappeared very quickly um, and it's very very expensive over Amazon which I think is the only way you can get it at the moment so I understand that many people might not have it so it, what I'd like to do is just give an introduction to the book but if you understood the title you probably understand the whole book and that's why the, the key of the, the key to this to this book is actually understanding the title. So I'll briefly just talk a little bit about the title. For Da'il al Awqat has two words. The word Awqat is the is the one I'll start with. Awqat um, I, is is connected to the, is the plural of the word Waqt. Now Waqt is the the word for time, and it's the Waqat al means to determine a thing to determine, to make it specific. So, if something is has this process of waqata on it, it is very limited, it's very specific, which is why the Arabic word for temporary is mu'akkat. So you have, for example, this visa is mu'akkat. Uh, you only have 90 days as a visitor to Malaysia to stay, and after 90 days they'll throw you in jail if you don't, if you overstay, because your permission is mu'akkat. It's mu'akkat limited. So the word waqt is very to do, is to do with limitation. We have the word miqat, which is another very important word. What does miqat mean? Where did, what's, what's miqat? <coughs> Sorry? Station. Station. What, um, could you be a bit more specific? A specific, a specific place or a specific time? Uh, usually it's understood to be a specific place. Where? Uh, Tan'im, Dhul Hulayfa. Uh, Jarjum, these, these are the the Mu'aqit of the Hajj. And the Miqat of the Hajj is actually two. One is the physical Miqat of the, the place, and there's the time of the Miqat. So you cannot do Hajj in Ramadan. Hajj, you can't make intention for Hajj in Ramadan. Why? Because the Miqat of Hajj is the first of Shawwal. So now you can do Hajj, or you can make intention for Hajj. Now, you can't make intention for Hajj last month because it's a specific time. And after the night of the uh, after the night of Dhul of, of Hajjah has passed, then you can no longer make intention for Hajj. But up until between these specific points, these are the miqat of the Hajj of time, and the miqat is of time and the physical t uh, space. And the physical space includes, for example, Dhul Hulayfa, which is the one you mentioned. Dhul Hulayfa is just outside of Al Medina. And when the Prophet Muhammad went there, he stopped and he did his ghusl, he put on his ihram. And you mentioned Tana'im, these are the two he mentioned. And Tana'im is also important for another reason. Because Sayyidatina Aisha radiallahu anha had come into the Miqat already. She had passed the Miqat and had come in to perform the Hajj. But because she was not permitted to do the tawaf, she was not in ihram. And so when she was now uh, able to do the, the tawaf, she, she, her period had finished, the Prophet, she asked the Prophet وسلم, what should I do? And he instructed her and uh, her, her brother, Abdurrahman, to go to Tana'im. And then to take a ghusl there, put on an ihram and re-enter. So Tana'im became this very specific point where she made her ghusl. And then after that, that same point became the place where everybody knew that if you wanted to do it, the, the same thing, you go to the maqam of Aisha or miqat of Aisha or Masjid Aisha, which is actually Tana'im. So Tana'im is the correct geographical name. But when people talk about it, they don't call it Tana'im, they say Masjid Aisha. And we know it's the place where she did the sajda. Masjid means the place of sajda. Al Aisha. So miqat is something which is very limited. So um, 
This is, this is one word of the two words, and it's to do with limitation. Now, the other word is fadail, which is the plural again of fadl. Now, fadl has many, many meanings. Usually, it's translated as blessing, which is the way we've done here. Now, one of the meanings, the classical meanings, is to overcome, to win. Fadl juhayma bani kada wa kada. The tribe of Juhayma beat so and so. Okay? They overpowered them. They won the battle. Okay? So the word fadal here means to win. To win a battle. To overcome. To out overpower. Now that doesn't really translate well. The overcoming of, power of time. The battle of time. We'll come back to that. Another meaning is blessings, which is the one we've been used here, and therefore it's synonymous with barakah. What does barak or blessings mean? Because these are words which are kind of classical words, both in English, if I ask people to explain what blessings are, and unless they're actually Christian, very few people can explain what it means. And if they are Christian, it depends whether they're Catholic or Protestant, because they have different meanings. So when I ask somebody in English to say, Tell me what blessings mean. I'm not sure. Can anybody help me? Any English teachers here? If I said this, uh, there's a blessing in this, what would you mean? Help me. No? Glad tidings. That's Bushra. Um, that's, perhaps that's one element of it. And if I were to ask you in Arabic, ma ma'anat al-baraka, what does baraka mean? Tashrahli? Naam. What does it mean? It's, a, it's also a difficult word to explain. It actually means ziyada, increase. And the, the best example, I, you know, I'm a primary school teacher by profession. I don't do clever stuff. I just tell stories. So I'll give you a story of what baraka means. I used to live in the basement flat, in a basement flat in a place called Kilburn in London. Uh, it's dark and it's Kilburn and alhamdulillah I used to uh, in those days maybe I was uh, better in Ibadah and I used to fast occasionally outside of Ramadan and one day I was, I was fasting and uh, alhamdulillah someone the day before that had brought some dates from Al Medina so I thought oh, yes this is lucky dates tomorrow I'm fasting and then just as Maghrib came in some people came to visit me at Maghrib time I'm thinking, Marib, I want to break my fast. And so I quickly break my fast with my dates, and I'm thinking, it's time to pray. What am I going to do with these date pips? Somebody had just brought these dates from Al Medina. I can't just throw them in the bin. There was a plant pot which was ready to plant something in, and I thought, it's okay, I'll just put it in there. So I just put it in the plant. I didn't plant the date pip, I just put the, because I needed to pray. So I prayed, and I forgot all about it until. This is the one of the dates of Al-Madinah to Al-Manawwara. Even in Kilburn, in a basement flat, it has baraka. It started to grow. It seed. I thought, wow! Now I understand the hadith of baraka. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Oh Allah, give us blessing in our measure of dates. So the dates of Medina have baraka. So alhamdulillah, let it grow. I didn't plant anything, it just grew. And it grew. And it grew. And this is a basement flat, and soon the window was covered with this bush. This is Kilburn. We're not talking about Dubai. We're talking about a basement flat in London. And then my friend from, who lived on the third floor flat, a few roses down, she came along. She said, oh, a lovely plant you've got there. Could I take a cutting? I'm thinking, maybe Mr. Joy. I don't know. Can you take cuttings of date plants? I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just pretend that I know what I'm doing. So she took a cutting. A couple of months later, I go and visit her. And what had happened? She's got a bush growing on her. Well, she's on the third floor, so you can expect some baraka there. So what baraka means is it just grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. Okay? Now, I don't know what blessing means. And I don't really know what baraka means. But this is the story that explains what baraka is. That is blessing. That is baraka. So fadl means baraka. It means ziyad. It means 
Taghlib, it means to overcome, to overpower. It also means the best. Al-Afdal is the best. And you can see the connection between overcoming, overpowering, winning a war and being the best. So the Afdal is the best. Um, and, a, um, and it always reminds me of Sheikh uh, al-Sharqawi, uh, a uh, famous Egyptian scholar who was able to do tafsir in the, in, in the simplest terms of, of Egyptian dialect. And he says um, uh, that he was explaining, well anyway, just to cut it short, he says, Al Ahsan Batih, Ahsan min Ahsan Mish, Wa Ahsan Mish, Ahsan min Ahsan Mafish. And that means the best melon is better than the best apricot. And the best apricot is the better than the best nothing. Uh, but it sounds better in Egyptian. <laughs> but, uh, and this is even in Tafsir, but that's another story. So what it means here is the best of the best. So something, there's, to be afdal means to be the best of something. But the, but the best of that character, that characteristic, could be the better than something else. So melons, in my view, are always better than durian because they don't stink <laughs> but I have a prejudice okay and they are, are better than apricots because apricots are tiny and they're not juicy okay so the the the, the fodl is to do with levels okay so here put the two together you've got something which is completely specific and limited it's very specific and it's very limited the word waqt. And then you have something fadl, which means the exact opposite, which means to be overpowering, overcoming, the best, blessed, increasing. So what you have here is the fadail of the awqat. How do you get the best out of what is limited? How do you get the best out of what is limited? And that's what the title fadail al awqat is. And again, I can only... Um, tell stories really I don't really know a great deal so I'm going to tell two quick stories from my personal experience again um, once the best trip I ever made to Al Madinah to Al Manawara was the shortest um, we were in the house of Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi Al Maliki and I was with somebody who was about to travel back to Germany I brought him for Umrah he had, he had some issues some mental health issues and he says, please, could you help me? I says, well, I'm going to, to Umrah next week. Do you want to come with me? He says, yeah. So I got him a ticket. We came. And then he, he, he had to go back early. So the ticket was limited. It was the next day he was going to go. I says, it's okay. We'll go to Sayyid Muhammad bin Ali al Maliki. -Malik. You haven't got time to go to Al-Madinah because the ticket's so limited. You came for such a short time, you can't do it. So it doesn't matter. We'll go to his grandson, Sayyid Muhammad bin Ali al-Maliki. But don't worry. Leave it in my hands. Maybe I'll sort something out. When I got there, I knew there was a few people who worked for Saudi Airlines among the students of Sayyid Muhammad bin Ali bin Maliki. We came into the Daras, I pulled them aside and said, can you do anything for me? Here's a ticket. We have a flight in six hours' time. Could you postpone it for another 24 hours or 12 hours? Do anything you can, just do something. And then we went to the Daras. At the end of the Daras, um, I asked Sayyid Muhammad al Maliki, can, I, can we leave now? He says, no. Time for food. You can't leave. He says, you can cut, anybody can come in by their own free will, but you can't leave except with permission. Khalas, we'll miss our flight. Um, or you miss my flight. Mine's the following week. I don't know, worry about my ticket. And then I thought, okay, Sheikh has spoken. Doesn't matter. And then just as we're about, the flight is coming close. The guy come from Saudi, Saudi Airlines comes and he changes. 24 hours you've got. So... Ask, we finally get permission from Sayyid Muhammad al Maliki, and I turn to the brother Ismail. Ismail, we're going to Al Madina now. He says, No, we're not. We're going to the airport. He says, No, we're not going to Al Madina. So we prayed, we set off, and it was the, the most beautiful journey I've ever made. It was the most powerful. I remember I took one of Sayyid Muhammad al Maliki's books, which is on, on the Ziyarat al Madina. So I read it on the way with him. And we went over a couple of things. One of the things I said to him was, uh, you have to make intention. You have no worldly concerns in this trip. 
If you have any worldly concerns, it's not a correct ziyara. You can... Anything can have massive intentions, but they have to be connected to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it can't be for get, buying gold. It can't be for uh, any of those things that normally people go to Al Medina for. Well, that's my experience taking taking Umrah groups. But anyway, so we went, and on the way, I said, "You have to make intention to revive a Sunnah that you used to have and you've forgotten." And I thought, actually, you know, I don't use miswak anymore. I don't use the siwak. Inshallah, I must use the siwak. And how stupid am I? In the rush, I didn't bring, bring any utter. And when we arrive, it's going to be Jum'ah, and the Adhan will probably be called on the... So the bus pulled in just before the, the, the thing. And these were my two intentions. Where am I going to get utter? And I need to do the ziyar and get back on the bus as quickly as possible. And the Adhan had been called. But there was one man sitting at the bus with one utter and the adhan is called to it illegal to sell utter so he's sitting there the bus pulls in he gets off and he gives me the utter <laughs> and then he closes his thing and he goes he only had one utter left and he, his, his, his understanding was he's not breaking the law because the, uh, he's not going to sell it so he just gave me the utter and then I, the other thing I forgot I didn't bring any money or much money and so I'm walking and I see this beggar walking towards me from really far and I, think, I can see he's aiming for me and I don't have any money <laughs> so I'm dodging him and I'm dodging him and I'm dodging him and I'm dodging him and he won't budge he's focused on me <laughs> and I'm thinking all oh, you've got the wrong guy pal you know you've got I don't have anything and when you get to me I'm just going to explain to you I'm really sorry I don't have any money and you're not going to believe me and he comes up to me and gets up the seat. Let go. And then he left. <laughs> and then we did a quick ziyara. Um, and then we got on the bus and went home. And alhamdulillah, I, I lived there, so I, I had lots of opportunities to go to me, but this was the best. Um, and one of the best hajjahs was when I led a group, which if it was permitted to say there was a group from hell, <laughs> then this would be it. But seeing as you can never describe a Hajj group as the, the group from hell, uh, I won't call them that. But they were very, very difficult. Very, very, very difficult. Alhamdulillah, I took a lot of groups for Hajj, but none were as difficult as this one. Um, I won't go into details, but I'll give you just one part of why they were difficult. Everyone was focused on themselves. Nobody really cared about anybody else. And they expected five-star hajj for two-star prices. Um, and it was very difficult. So when we got off and they'd been... And the thing was, I didn't, pay, I didn't do hajj for a job. I had a friend who did hajj and he asked me to leave the group and I paid whatever I could. If I had all of the money, I paid for the hajj. If I had half the money, I paid half of the money. If I had nothing, he would have given it to me for free. But that wasn't the plan. And alhamdulillah, this year I paid everything. So it was not that I was doing... I don't owe anybody anything. I'm just like every other hujjah. Every other. So we got off the bus and they'd given me a hard time all this. So I just asked, please, could you look after my bag? Because I will go in and get everybody their rooms. And, they, and so I got everybody their rooms, come out to get my bag and the bus has left. And I have nothing. I have my ihram. Fortunately, the passport was with the group leader. So I have two pieces of cloth. I don't have a penny and I have no other clothes and it was the best Hajj I ever did um, unfortunately I missed some of my prayers in the, in the, in the masjid in Jama'ah and the reason why was because when my clothes were being washed I couldn't leave the bathroom <laughs> but there was one brother he saw what, he was he was the exception to everybody else he saw me and he, he saw the difficulty I was in, you know, two pieces of cloth for, for two weeks. He came and he gave me this shirt, still in his wrapper. And I thought, you are so sweet. This shirt is never going to fit me, but you are so sweet. I love you, brother. Well, I love you, uncle. And I did. I really loved this man. And he, anyway, there was, it was a difficult hajj. So I was doing lots and lots of khidmah for things that I shouldn't really be doing. Um, 
and it was really tiring. After about 36 hours with no sleep, I came back into the, I came into the, into the hotel and I, was, I don't think I'd ever been that tired. An uncle was sitting there waiting for me. I had never been that tired in my life. And he looked at me and he says, please, could you take me for tawaf? And I had so many demands. Every time people were nagging me, do this, do this, do this, do that, do the other. And now this man, when I'm this tired, he turns around and he says, will you take me for tawaf? And I looked at his face and I says, of course. <laughs> and it was the best tawaf I ever made. I had never been that tired, but because there was something about this man. And alhamdulillah, I survived the hajj. And I use the word survived because it was very, very difficult. And I can't pretend it was... It was, it, I, I, it was a difficult time. But the one person was uncle. And I don't, to this day, I don't know what his name was. <laughs> to me, he was just uncle. And I was living in America this, this, this time. And the group, Hujaj, were from the UK. So I went back to the States and I thought, Alhamdulillah, I'm never going to see any of them again, except uncle. One day I'll see uncle. And I promised him I'll come to see him. He says, please, soon. No, he was never demanding. He just said, could you take me for... Omar, could you take me for tawaf? And he said, soon. And I says, yes, very soon. <laughs> and I says, yes, I promise, as soon as I can, I will come. About six weeks later, I came back. I went to the guy that organized the Hajj, and I says, do you know, uncle, how can I find him? And he just looked at me and says, he died. Yeah. And so that's why I never know what uncle's name was because he was just uncle and then it all made sense why that was the best tawaf I ever made it's because I made it with uncle the one that gave me the shirt I still have the shirt it doesn't fit of course uh, but there was something about him what was it he understood time he understood something about time and there was there was real barakah in his time there was real fadl in his time so fadail al-awqat is about how to get to be like uncle how to do a umrah trip or a ziyarat of al-madinah like that one because they were accidents i didn't do anything there it wasn't me i was just lucky so that's what the book called fadail al-awqat let me just read a little of it um, for, for the Baraka. Um, people of my age are very much influenced by Bruce Lee. Yes? Anybody of my age? A few people, a few people much younger than me, but still influenced by Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee said, he says some really amazing things, and one of the things he says, if you love life, if you love life, don't waste time. For well, time is what life is made of. Ajeeb. Anyway, that's what Sayyidina Sheikh Bruce Lee said. <laughs> Sayyidina Sheikh Mawlana Afifuddin al Jailani has a very important role in this book. Um, and out of Adab, I will read from his, his own words. Um, so time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears, swears oaths by time. So Sheikh uh, Afifuddin, he says, which is page five for anyone that has it. We as believers know that with certainty the importance of time in our lives. That's an interesting statement because I have a friend who works in prisons in Denmark, um, Wasim. And once he was giving uh, a talk to other chaplains and other people who work in hospitals. And, and they, of course, they know about religion. And they all know that Muslims pray five times a day. But they didn't know that they pray five times on specific times, very specific times. So he was giving, and this lady says, wow. She knows she's a priest. She knows about Salah, but she didn't know the importance of time of Salah. So she said to her, she said to him, Wow, you Muslims must really understand time. And he just smiled. Because we have a phrase, I don't know if anybody speaks Urdu here, but we have a phrase in, uh, in uh, England, we have apna time. 
Apna time could be translated as general Muslim time. So, seven o'clock, do you mean seven o'clock Apna time or seven o'clock general Muslim time or general seven o'clock British time? I'm very, very British. If you say seven o'clock, it means seven o'clock. And I used to have a daris at seven o'clock and I would be the first one there, the only one there, and I would start the daris on my own. And the first time I did that, I did the Hadith al awwali if anyone knows it. And when the people came in, I said, you've missed the most important Hadith, which is Hadith al awwali and you'll never get it. Because it's the first Hadith, and if you miss Hadith al awwali you miss the whole Hadith. Khalas, bye-bye. <laughs> and after that, they all turned up on time. That was one particular daris. So, apana time means our sort of time. And that's really sad, because this Christian lady, she knew what the importance of time is to a Muslim. But it seems that the Muslims don't understand the importance of time. So, Sheikh Afifuddin says, We as believers know with certainty the importance of time in our lives. For Allah the transcendent and exalted has made this clear in his noble book, by his glorification of time and expounding upon its value. He swore oaths by portion of the day and night to show us the importance of those portions. As this is the case with portions of the day, then what of its entirety? He transcended as he swears by the dawn. Well, Fajri, well, Ayali Nashr, well, Shafi, well, Witr. He swears by the dawn. And on another occasion, he swears by the mid morning. What duha? and elsewhere by the last part of the night. All of these indicate the importance of specific times by which we may attain his pleasure. Indeed, Allah has established worship as five daily prayers, the fast, pilgrimage, and all other forms of worship within specific times. So you can't worship Allah unless you know what the time is so that we will pay attention to the time as well as the actual worship. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said about the prayer when asked which act is most beloved to Allah, he says, As-salah ala waqtiha, the prayer in its time. And this is why we must plan our time and take full advantage of the days of our lives before they end. There are several introductions to this, and Shaykh Afifuddin, his, his comes first. And somebody asked me, uh, it was Hisham, for those people that know Hisham, because he's now got a book and he's got several people who have written introductions and he doesn't know what to do because they're all sheikhs. So which one comes first? I says, I have no problem. Sheikh Afifuddin always comes first. And I said, the reason why are two. One, he's my sheikh. And that's the most important. But, but second is because he has a special place in this book. Um, it's not a, it was not an easy book to translate. Alhamdulillah, I've translated a number of books and most of this book I did within a couple of months. But there was one hadith uh, which I could never get to grips with, to the extent that I actually said the publisher cannot publish it until I'm satisfied with this hadith. And so he, I said, send it to these 10 editors, all Arabic, well known Arabic translators. I went to a number of mashayikh of hadith and went to ask for an explanation of particular of the meaning of this hadith. Is it? And one of them, Sheikh Ninawi, he just looked at me and says, Hada Mushkil. <laughs> and that was it. And so if people who understand that, he says, Hada Mushkil, this is a problem. And I didn't get anything more than that. And I was getting frustrated, and the publisher was getting frustrated because there was no way I was going to get it let it publish until I was satisfied with this book. And somebody asked me, do, do, have I ever seen any of the Quran, the miracles of Sheikh Afifuddin, Mawlana Afifuddin? And this is one of them. Somebody went to visit him in, in he was in Singapore. And th this, this was one of the group, one of the people related to the publisher. So she Sheikh Afifuddin had said, so how's Abdulaziz getting on with the, with the book? And he says, actually he has a problem. And I didn't ask Sheikh Afifuddin to explain this hadith because I don't, like to ask him questions like that it's difficult to it's difficult to speak to him at the best of time but to ask him something specific and also this is not a specialism you know he's a murshid and he, he guides the whole you know he's but he, he so I, I never bothered all the other people I asked but I didn't ask Sheikh Afifuddin so he says to Sheikh Afifuddin he's got a problem with hadith number 13 so Sheikh Afifuddin just like he says you know what the problem is is that word 
it means limping because somebody is leaning over your shoulder and making it difficult. That's what the word means. I didn't tell him that that was the word I was, had a problem with. And the man, but he just, Sheikh, just picked the book up and he just says, oh, that's what the problem is. Just tell Abdulaziz that was what it means. <laughs> the man phoned me from, from Singapore and he says, the word, such and such word means this. And I thought, wow, once that word makes sense, everything else makes sense. Because now you have to change things very, very slightly because now the whole, halas, now you can publish it. And I, then I thought, he is the key to the book. He's the key to the book. And that's why I wanted to read a little bit from what he said first. Um, if I could jump to page 14. Still in the introduction. This is now the translator's introduction. It says, the ti Arabic title is Fada'il al awqat Fada'il is the plural of Fadila, which is usually translated as moral excellence, excellent quality, virtue, or merit. So that's the normal translation. We went to what the roots of the word is. It is derived from the word Fadala, which means to go beyond, to excel, to be excessive, to go beyond. So to go beyond the limits of the waqt is to do Fada'il. Those who act upon the contents of this book are seeking extra blessing. So you want your life to be like that seed. That's what you want. If you only have a short time, you want it to grow and grow and grow. You want to get the most of it. And also you want it to end up as a fadila, as a moral character. A moral character. What does moral character mean? And this is something, again, um, maybe it's just being in the presence in, in Dar al Jailani that makes me think so much of Maulana is that moral character is really, when I say this isn't his specialism, hadith isn't his specialism, but it is. Actually, if you're saying what any of his specialism is, it's moral character. You know, his emphasis is on making people good, making you good, and talking about fadila, about moral character. And I know, I don't, I'm not very clever, as you've probably gathered, and I don't know a great deal about hadith and stuff like this. But alhamdulillah, many people have embraced Islam around me. And none of them have embraced Islam because I'm clever. They've all embraced Islam for very simple things. And when people ask me, my teacher is a Sheikh, Habib Ahmed Mashur al Haddad, somebody asked me, so what was the most important thing that you can remember about Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad and it was caught me off guard I said his smile and that's actually the first thing that came to my mind about this great scholar was his smile and the next time I was introduced they says and this man Abdulaziz Ahmed he studied with Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad and you can tell by his smile and then I realized actually that the most important thing in the dawah, in calling people to the deen, is actually the smile. Is actually saying, hi, hello, how are you? 